Hello, I'm Annette Young and welcome to the 51% a show about women reshaping our world coming up. The Irish Government and the Catholic Church apologise over a network of religious institutions that have abused and shamed unmarried mothers and their children for much of the 20th century. And the human cost of shame in India will be talking to Indian author Sonia Valero about her latest book on the tragic deaths of two young female cousins whose bodies were found hanging from a tree in western Uttar Pradesh. We'll also be looking at how women are playing a key role in the Indian farming protests against government reforms. But we begin in Ireland where a shocking report has revealed that some 9,000 children died in the country's mother and baby homes. First opened in the 1920s, they were not closed until the 1990s and deemed as a last refuge for unmarried mothers with nowhere to go. Yet abuse and neglect were rampant in these Catholic church-run institutions. The reports released resulting in apologies from both the Irish government and church officials. Camille Nedelec has more. Now a place of remembrance and public mourning, but for decades the hundreds of babies and toddlers buried here were forgotten. They died in one of Ireland's most notorious mother and baby homes in Galway, one of the centres where unmarried mothers lived, as getting pregnant out of wedlock made them social outcasts. State funded and run by nuns, the homes were in operation up until the 1990s and were rife with abuse. We're neglected, no love shown whatsoever. Uh, it wouldn't have been done to animals while we had to suffer. And Babies crying, crying uh, uh, through the night. Why? Because they were uncomfortable, they were neglected, starved and cold. It was the discovery of the mass grave that triggered an apology from the Pope and sparked a years-long inquiry into the mistreatment of mothers and children in these homes. The almost 3,000-page report reveals that in all, 9,000 children died, 15% of the total. One home in the 1940s had a death rate of over 70%. The report prompted a formal apology from the Taoiseach and a pledge to pay reparations to the victims. We treated women exceptionally badly. We treated children exceptionally badly. We had a completely warped attitude to sexuality and intimacy and young mothers and their sons and daughters were forced to pay a terrible price for that dysfunction. The government also plans to excavate some of the remains and to amend the law so that adoptees can find out about their origins, which until now had been off limits. Many relatives have spent years hoping for answers. Um, I wondered, where are they? Are they dead? Uh, are they walking around America? Do they know who I am? Do they know who they are? Do they know any of this is going on while well, we're being traumatised here? But some survivors' groups say the report isn't enough and are calling for a criminal investigation to be launched. Now, on this show, we've frequently talked about India's endemic problem of sexual violence, with the country viewed as being one of the most dangerous places in the world for women. This despite a massive outcry over the brutal gang rape of a student in Delhi in 2012, which led to new anti-rape laws and harsher punishments. Sonia Falero is an Indian author of narrative non-fiction. Her latest book is The Good Girls, An Ordinary Killing, which will be released later this month. It focuses on the tragic deaths of two young female cousins whose bodies were found hanging from a tree in Western Uttar Pradesh. She joins me now from London. Sonia, thank you so much for your time. What drew you to this particular story? It was the image of the children, which uh, I first saw on Twitter, same as uh, everyone else in urban India. These two girls, one 16, one 14, in their salvar kameezas hanging from a tree by their necks in, in, in a village uh, not too far away from uh, Delhi, which is where the 2012 Delhi gang rape took place, and not uh, not even more than two years after that heinous crime. And the picture of those children uh, brought on the realization that while the government had put in uh, a certain amount of effort into improving safety for girls and women in India, 
it wasn't working um, as, as well as it should have. And yet it seems that despite that uproar, both nationally and internationally, over that tragic gang rape in 2012, that not much has really changed for women in India. If anything, it appears to have got worse, especially with a conservative Hindu nationalist government. Yeah, absolutely. The Bharatiya Janata Party has a very narrow, very patriarchal, frankly menacing view of uh, a woman's role in society. And in fact, uh, their their election manifesto last year included the Freudian slip that they would commit crimes against women. And since then, major leaders in the party have been accused and arrested of rape. Major leaders have participated in protests, protecting in support of rapists. And uh, we've seen uh, recently that a chief minister of, uh, um, of a major state in the country has said that women who work outside the house must report to the police station so that their whereabouts can be tracked. Since the BJP has come to power, in fact, fewer women are working outside the home, fewer women are seeking education, and more women are doing unpaid work. So in every area of a woman's life in India, um, there have been considerable setbacks in recent years. So, Sonia, how much does the car system play a role in ensuring that women are viewed effectively as being properties of their families? The caste system is the single greatest impediment to progress in India, individual progress and the progress of communities as a whole. Because what the caste system does is that it defines your place in the world before you're even born. It's something that you inherit from your mother and father. And I don't know how much your viewers know this, but you once you are born into a caste, you don't get to leave. You don't get to change it. You don't get to move up. You choose, would not choose to move down, certainly. And your caste determines everything you do. It determines the jobs that you're allowed to have, the food you're meant to eat, the clothes you're allowed to wear, where you can travel. So as long as the caste system uh, is perpetuated, as long as it continues, I don't see how women can, can, can hope for any significant progress in India. Sonia, I just want to take a pause there because we have a report on how a growing number of women are participating in those farmers' protests in India against government reforms. Yet despite making up a sizeable percentage of farm workers, hardly any women own land. For instance, in the region of Uttar Pradesh, where Sonia's book is based, an Oxfam report found only 6% of women own land, while just 4% had access to institutional credit. Selena Sykes has more. They prepare meals, serve tea and snacks, providing the fuel which helps the protesters keep on going. We cook from morning to evening for our brothers. This is our contribution. We are standing shoulder to shoulder with the men. In India, farming has always been largely dominated by men. Even when they work in the fields, women are considered as farmers' wives without a say. But Parminda isn't afraid of speaking up. We are farmers. If our land is taken away, what will we do? What will we eat? What will I tell my children? That we never went there to protest? We never raised our voice against the government? The authorities have introduced several reforms which allow farmers to sell their produce on the free market at their chosen price. After decades of selling through state-run markets with a guaranteed minimum price, farmers are concerned about losing earnings, a fear that has pushed women to take part in the protests, and not just those who work in agriculture. Jassy has been involved in the movement since the very beginning. It's not just the men who do agriculture. Like, agriculture has so many things, like cattle and then poultry farms and so many things which are done by women. So when I say it's going to affect everyone, that includes women too. The filmmaker contributes to a fortnightly newspaper for farmers and posts about their actions on social media. She is also in charge of teaching the protesters' children who've been at the sit-in for several weeks. All the families live in a camp on the outskirts of Delhi. It's the protesters' way of showing the government that everyone is affected. So much so that the balance of power of households is at stake. Women are warning that if family income falls, tension and violence committed by men could increase.
And listening to that report with me is Sonia Falero, an Indian author. Sonia, does it surprise you that in this very conservative society, a number of women are joining those farmers' protests? No, it doesn't at all. I mean, on the one hand, Annette, we know that women in India are much more likely to inherit land as widows uh, than they are as daughters or wives. And this is despite the fact that anywhere you go in India, you see women participating in the fields, uh, looking after cattle, looking after poultry, uh, as we heard in your report. And this is over and above the time that they spend at home, which is on average six hours a day off work uh, in the home, cooking and, and looking after the children. But, you know, women, they really do um, hold up the sky. And this is so true in India, where agricultural work would not be able to progress at the speed it does if it wasn't for the support of women. And I think that women have a very good understanding of uh, the amount of money that is used to run a family and the repercussions personally on them if a family's income falls. Because all the women in India are not allowed to earn money uh, in, 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 in many of these agricultural families, and they are not allowed to, to spend the money they do know exactly how it works because they are such an uh, integral part of uh, of the system. So it doesn't surprise me at all. And I think that their presence has really made a huge impact in India and drawn attention and support that perhaps uh, the, the protest might not have been able to um, have gained otherwise. Sonia Falero, it's been wonderful speaking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that's it for this edition. You can also connect with us via our Facebook page, that of course being France24.51%, or do send us a tweet at underscore 51%. So until our next show, bye for now.